This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Three. We have seen in the previous chapter how law originated in established usage and custom, and how, from the beginning, it has represented a skillful mixture of social habits necessary to the preservation of the human race with other customs imposed by those who used popular superstition, as well as the right of the strongest for their own advantage. This double character of law has determined its own later development during the growth of political organization. Whilst in the course of ages the nucleus of social custom inscribed in law has been subjected to but slight and gradual modifications, the other portion has been largely developed in defections indicated by the interests of the dominant classes and to the injury of the classes they oppress. From time to time, these dominant classes have allowed a law to be extorted from them, which presented, or appeared to present, some guarantee for the disinherited. But then such laws have but repealed a previous law, made for the advantage of the ruling caste. The best laws, says Buckle, were those which repealed the preceding ones. But what terrible efforts have been needed, what rivers of blood have been spilt, every time there has been a question of the repeal of one of these fundamental enactments serving to hold the people in fetters. Before she could abolish the vestiges of serfdom and feudal rights, and break up the power of the royal court, France was forced to pass through four years of revolution and twenty years of war. Decades of conflict are needful to repeal the least of the iniquitous laws, bequeathed to us by the past, and even then they scarcely disappear except in periods of revolution. The history of the genesis of capital has already been told by socialists many times. They have described how it was born of war and pillage, of slavery and serfdom, of modern fraud and exploitation. They have shown how it is nourished by the blood of the worker, and how little by little it has conquered the whole world. The same story concerning the genesis and development of law has yet to be told. As usual, the popular intelligence has stolen a march upon men of books. It has already put together the philosophy of this history and is busy laying down its essential landmarks. Law, in its quality of guarantee of the results of pillage, slavery, and exploitation, has followed the same phrases of development as capital. Twin brother and sister, they have advanced hand in hand, sustaining one another with the suffering of mankind. In every country in Europe, their history is approximately the same. It has differed only in detail. The main facts are alike, and to glance at the development of law in France or Germany is to know its essential traits, its phases of development, in most of the European nations. In the first instance, law was a national part of contract. Such a contract was agreed upon between the legions and people at the Champ de Mar. A relic of the same period is preserved even yet in the field of May of the primitive Swiss cantons, despite the alterations affected by the interference of centralizing and middle-class civilization. It is true that this contract was not always freely accepted. Even in those early days, the rich and strong were imposing their will upon the rest. But at all events, they encountered an obstacle to their encroachments in the mass of the people, who often made them feel their power in return. But as the church on one side, and the nobles on the other, succeeded in enthralling the people, the right of lawmaking escaped from the hands of the nation, and passed into those of the privileged orders. Fortified by the wealth accumulating in her coffers, the church extended her authority, she tampered more and more with private life, and under pretext of saving souls, 
she seized upon the labor of her serfs. She gathered taxes from every class. She increased her jurisdiction. She multiplied penalties and enriched herself in proportion to the number of offenses committed. For the produce of every fine poured into her coffers. Laws had no longer any connection with the interest of the nation. They might have been supposed to emanate rather from a council of religious fanatics than from legislators, observes an historian of French law. At the same time, as the baron likewise extended his authority over laborers in the fields and artisans in the towns, he too became legislator and judge. The few relics of national law dating from the 10th century are merely agreements regulating service, statute labor, and tribute due from serf and vassals to their lord. The legislators of that period were a handful of brigands organized for the plunder of a people daily becoming more peaceful as they applied themselves to agricultural pursuits. These robbers exploited the feelings for justice inherent in the people. They posed as the administrators of that justice, made a source of revenue for themselves out of its fundamental principles, and concocted laws to maintain their own dominations. Later on, these laws collected and classified by jurists formed the foundation of our modern codes. And are we to talk about respecting these codes, the legacy of baron and priest? The first revolution, the revolt of the townships, was successful in abolishing a portion only of these laws. The charters of enfranchised towns are, for the most part, a mere compromise between baronial and episcopal legislation and the new relations created within the free borough itself. Yet what a difference between these laws and the laws we have now. The town did not take upon itself to imprison and execute citizens for reasons of state. It was content to expel anyone who plotted with the enemies of the city and to raise his house to the ground. It confined itself to imposing fines for so-called crimes and misdemeanors, and in the townships of the 12th century may even be discerned the just principle today forgotten, which holds the whole community responsible for the misdoing of each of its members. The societies of that time looked upon crime as an accident or misfortune, a conception common amongst the Russian peasantry at this moment. Therefore, they did not admit of the principle of personal vengeance as preached by the Bible, but considered that the blame for each misdeed reverted to the whole society. It needed all the influence of the Byzantine Church, which imported into the West the refined cruelties of Eastern despotism, to introduce into the manners of Gauls and Germans the penalty of death, and the horrible fortunes afterwards inflicted on those regarded as criminals. Just in the same way, it needed all the influence of the Roman Code, the product of the corruption of Imperial Rome, to introduce the notions as to absolute property in land which have overthrown the communistic customs of primitive people. As we know, the free townships were not able to hold their own. Torn by intestine dissensions between rich and poor, burgher and serf, they fell an easy prey to royalty. And as royalty acquired fresh strength, the right of legislation passed more and more into the hands of a clique of courtiers. Appeal to the nation was made only to sanction the taxes demanded by the king. Parliament summoned at intervals of two centuries, according to the good pleasure or caprice of the court, councils extraordinary, assemblies of notables, ministers, scarce heeding the grievances of the king's subjects. These are the legislators of France. Later still, when all power is concentrated in a single man, who can say, I am the state, edicts are concocted in the secret councils of the prince, according to the whim of a minister or of an imbecile king, and subjects must obey on pain of death. 
All judicial guarantees are abolished. The nation is the serf of royalty and of a handful of courtiers. And at this period, the most horrible penalties startle our gaze. The wheel, the stake, flaying alive, tortures of every description, invented by the sick fancy of monks and madmen, seeking delight in the sufferings of executed criminals. The Great Revolution began the demolition of this framework of law, bequeathed to us by feudalism and royalty. But after having demolished some portions of the ancient edifice, the revolution delivered over the power of lawmaking to the bourgeoisie, who in their turn began to raise a fresh framework of laws intended to maintain and perpetuate middle-class domination amongst the masses. Their parliament makes laws right and left, and mountains of law accumulate with frightful rapidity. But what are all these laws at bottom? The major portion have but one object, to protect private property i.e., wealth acquired by the exploitation of man by man. Their aim is to open out to capital fresh fields for exploitation and to sanction the new forms which that exploitation continually assumes. As capital swallows up another branch of human activity, railways, telegraphs, electric light, chemical industries, the expression of man's thought in literature and science, etc. The object of the rest of these laws is fundamentally the same. They exist to keep up the machinery of government, which serves to secure to capital the exploitation and monopoly of the wealth produced. Magistrature, police, army, public instruction, finance, all serve one God, capital, all have but one object, to facilitate the exploitation of the worker by the capitalist. Analyze all the laws passed for the last 80 years, and you will find nothing but this. The protection of the person, which is put forward as the true mission of law, occupies an imperceptible space amongst them, for existing society assaults upon the person directly dictated by hatred and brutality tend to disappear. Nowadays, if anyone is murdered, it is generally for the sake of robbing him, rarely from personal vengeance. But if this class of crimes and misdemeanors is continually diminishing, we certainly do not owe the change to legislation. It is due to the growth of humanitarianism in our societies, to our increasingly social habits rather than to the prescriptions of our laws. Repeal tomorrow every law dealing with the protection of the person, and tomorrow stop all proceedings for assault. And the number of attempts dictated by personal vengeance and by brutality would not be augmented by one single instance. It will, perhaps, be objected that, during the last fifty years, a good many liberal laws have been enacted. But if these laws are analyzed, it will be discovered that this liberal legislation consists in the repeal of the laws bequeathed to us by the barbarism of preceding centuries. Every liberal law, every radical program, may be summed up in these words. Abolition of laws grown irksome to the middle class itself, and as an extension to all citizens of liberties enjoyed by the townships of the 12th century. The abolition of capital punishment, trial by jury for all crimes. There was a more liberal jury in the 12th century. The election of magistrates. The right of bringing public officials to trial the abolition of standing armies, free instruction, etc., everything that is pointed out as an invention of modern liberalism is but a return to the freedom which existed before king and church had laid hands upon every manifestation of human life. Thus, the protection of exploitation directly by laws on property and indirectly by the maintenance of the state 
is both the spirit and the substance of our modern codes, and the one function of our costly legislative machinery. But it is time we gave up being satisfied with mere phrases and learned to appreciate their real signification. The law which on its first appearance presented itself as a compendium of customs useful for the preservation of society, is now perceived to be nothing but an instrument for the maintenance of exploitation and the domination of the toiling masses by rich idlers. At the present day, its civilizing mission is nil. It has but one object, to bolster up exploitation. This is what is told us by history as to the development of law. Is it in virtue of this history that we are called upon to respect it? Certainly not. It has no more title to respect than capital, the fruit of pillage, and the first duty of the revolutionists of the 19th century will be to make a bonfire of all existing laws, as they will of all titles to property. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.